J. Jonah Jameson exists, and we've got proof. I'm wondering if Peter Parker took a photo of him. Will a wet t-shirt contest be part of the Avatar sequels? At this point, do we need to remind you, and you know who you are, not to leave a Marvel movie early? All that, plus we've got the latest multiverse news and so much more, and that's on today's edition of Slice. Covering all the news from every dark corner of the universe. Slice of Sci-Fi.com Hey, greetings everyone to another Slice of Sci-Fi. I'm Michael R. Menengay. I'm Noah Richman. And I'm Megan Zier. And I'm Ben Raginton. Awesome. Let's get some news. And now the news. Well, James Cameron wants to continue pushing motion capture technology to new heights on this new Avatar movie. Mm -hmm. To do that, he will take motion capture. Wait, wait for it. Underwater. <laughs> it's Avatar meets the Abyss. Wow. I, me, meets his IMAX films. Yeah. I, okay. Um, so now he has to film it in the Marianas Trench. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> That'd be great. That's it. Three miles down. Yeah. Let's put all the actors three miles down. It'll be great. Can't wait. <laughs> Oscar winner producer John Lando revealed that the next two Avatar movies will feature underwater filming. We have... A, we've kept a team of digital artists on from Avatar in order to test how we can create performance capture underwater, he said. We could simulate water in computer graphics, but we can't simulate the actor's experience, so we're going to capture performance in a tank. Okay. It's, uh, it's like I'm the abyss. sure. Okay, I guess. <laughs> he added that they are looking at techniques, including what we did before with reflective markers, and that an important task is how we record reference photography so that as we are going through the editorial process and the post-production workflow, we can see what the actors did and make sure that the final performance up on screen represents that. Does anybody fear that this is more about the technology and less about the story? Which has always been a Cameron thing. He's really big about... The art of the filmmaking instead of the story itself. This, exactly. We don't yep. care, but the art makes it look pretty, but when it comes down but to it, it's got to have a story. Yeah, well, all, all, all I can say is a sequel to Avatar. Well, but I mean, let's do something really groundbreaking and make the sequel better than the first one. How about that? How, well, <gasps> how's great. this for groundbreaking? Lando said that the two films will... Wrap up the story arc of our two main characters. Okay. Yeah, that's got me going. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Could we be closer to finding life on other worlds? Yes, I think that's very, very close. I think we're, I think we're way overdue for not finding something already. <laughs> at least something, at least something bacterial, microbial. Exactly. At least get something out there. I mean, we're all on board. Going, yeah, it's it's got to be there. Yeah, well, if if you if you want something to back you up on that, um, they're finding uh, f- with NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, uh, lead, uh, lead author and researcher Dr. Phil Yock is saying that his proposed technique could reveal as many as a hundred billion, mm-hmm. hundred billion, billion planets in. And you have to do it like Sam. Yeah, like Carl Sagan. Billion. That's true. Billion. Uh, <laughs> One hundred. Billion. billion planets. Uh, while microlensing measures the deflection of light from distant stars on its way toward Earth, the Kepler telescope is able to measure loss of light from a star when a planet orbits between Earth and the star. Oh, right. that's interesting. Yeah, that's how that's how they're finding all these planets is because of the dimming effect on the. That obviously the, something is passing in between exactly. us and that star. Right, and they're they've gotten it down so good now that they can actually give a pretty good idea of how far away it is how big it is it's pretty fascinating it's it's math people math is everywhere it's awesome basically they tag team together to make discovering earth type planets easier and yes the estimated figure is that there may be as many as a hundred billion planets Mm -hmm. similar to ours yes and they all have like evolved monkey people on them too right 
Uh, well, we're like hoping, that. or at least the uh, lizard people. But microlensing has already been used to discover planets similar in size to Neptune and Jupiter. Dr. Yock and his colleagues now believe they will more easily be able to discover smaller, more Earth-like worlds by utilizing a worldwide network of moderate-sized robotic telescopes. Mm. Yeah, but creating a network, it's... It, it's like it's, having it's like having it's a really doable. large telescope. It can give them infinite more resolution. Right, exactly. Well, DC is once again pushing the boundaries in comic books. They this story is awesome. They love to do this, and I I just can't say enough about how they are now introducing the first mm -hmm. transgender character in comics. Mm -hmm. The latest issue of Bat I, I I take issue with saying it's the first transgender uh, character in comics. Well, that's I true. have read true. comics with transgender characters. Uh, I agree with yeah, that. Actually, you make a point. A, a prominent transgender character. Uh, Sandman. Uh, well, uh, mm. That transgender Neil character Gaiman wasn't treated Sandman. very well, though. What was? I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Okay, <laughs> prominent main comic book. <laughs> okay, people let's, uh, read Batgirl let, let's, is the thing. <laughs> let's not distill it down too much. Well, than DC. That. <laughs> Regardless, say this because I love the story. Ben, go. Well, the latest issue of Batwoman finds Bat Alicia Girl. Bat Bat. So the latest issue of Batwoman is what was in no, the story. No, it's actually Batgirl. Oh, oh but you're Bat talking Girl? about Batwoman. Oh no, Batgirl. Batgirl has the character. Okay, well then you blame Hicks because he's the one who wrote this. <laughs> Batwoman has the lesbian, and right. I think that's in there somewhere. Well, right. it is in the story. <laughs> okay, people. The latest issue of Batgirl finds Alicia Yo revealing that she is a trans woman. Written by Gail Simone in issue 19, Yo reveals the information during a conversation with her roommate Barbara Gordon, so that would make it a Batgirl. It's a Batgirl, yes. Yo also reveals that she is bisexual. Simone says she drew inspiration for the conversation and storyline from a conversation with fellow comic artist Greg Ruka. Who's the other best? Ruka was asked at a WonderCon a couple of years ago why there are fewer gay male superhero than lesbian ones. And I, I gotta say, yeah, I would like to see more gay well, mm -hmm. I, and, and I would have to say, I didn't realize there were that many lesbian superheroes. <laughs> I, mean, I Actually, yeah. When I first saw the story, I thought, really? Okay. I there didn't are, realize there was such there, a proliferation. I, I mean, it's uh, it's a very male, it's a very masculine style. I think a lot, that, that a lot kind of in feels. comparison Ooh. to gay male superheroes. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Well, but, but uh, it was still, I, I, I can't name one. Batwoman. Uh, yeah, Batwoman. Other, okay, other than Batwoman. Batwoman, Karma. Mm. Okay, I'm having a hard time naming them now, too. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's see now. It, uh, Ruka, who co-created and rebooted Batwoman as a lesbian character, replied that it would be a real sign of change for a gay male character to appear on a comic book cover and an even bigger step for a transgender character to do the same. Mm. I looked out onto the audience, saw dozens of faces I knew well, LGBTQ folks mostly, all avid comic readers and superhero fans and DC supporters, said Simone, and it just hit me. Why was this so impossible? Why in the world can we not do a better job of representation of not just humanity, but also our own loyal audience? Mm -hmm. Thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Simone suggested the story to DC Comics co-publisher Dan DiDio at lunch one day, prepared to offer a passionate defense for the idea of a transgender character. I thought I might have to sell it, so to speak, said Simone. But he just paused for a moment and asked, how would this affect Barbara's story? And immediately approved it. And then we went back to eating our most excellent nachos. <laughs> yes, this is absolutely how it should be. So, yep. quick fire survey around the room. Noah, what do you think? Uh, it's absolutely how it should be. It's not something that it should even be a story. It's just like, I, I, okay, I, okay. Yeah. And then the character happens to be transgender. I, I, I agree 100%. I mean, it's 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 surprising that this has to, this is actually even an issue. It's like uh, <laughs> with as much diversity that we have with the characters inside of the comic book world anyway and how we try to show all different aspects of humanity, why hasn't this been done? And, and why is this such a big deal that we're doing it now? Megan? Well, I think it's great that they didn't make a big deal about approving it. I still think the story should be a big deal. Coming from Arizona, when we just had the whole bathroom bill fiasco, trans people need more um, mm. rep a positive representation. representation. Exactly, and comic books is a good place to do it. I okay. agree. Former Walking Dead pr producer Glenn Mazzara has found his next project. He's working on the script for a prequel to the Stanley Kubrick version of The Shining. This and I like scares me. I, I like that it is 
very specifically uh, spelled out that this is the Stanley Kubrick version of The Shining. Not the real not, Shining. Not, not, <laughs> not, not the actual the Stephen King. story. <laughs> we're that going to not take translate. the bastardized version that Kubrick threw up on the screen and we're going to remake that. <gasps> yeah, great. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> Can't you tell? The film will be called The Overlook Hotel, and while details are being kept under wraps, we can guess the film will cover the events that set the stage for the famous movie and focus on Delbert Grady. Fans may recall that Grady is discussed in the movie as the man who killed his wife and daughters with an axe. Okay, so we're going prequel? Prequel. Mm -hmm. Ah, Back in time. Right. Great. Why don't we just turn it into like Twilight episodes and we'll just basically take a story in each of the rooms each week and we can do something really dastardly. Actually, that, that, yeah. you, there you that got would be yeah, You have more, American Horror. That would actually Amer be better. Yeah. yeah. Actually, horror story it, it, right there. No, nah, actually four of uh, four rooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, we'll it, get Tarantino in. It'll be great. We'll get it, the hooker dead, the dead hooker stuffed in the mattress. It, it'll be fun. <laughs> you know, I, I have to say, I just, uh, just this past week saw the movie Room 237. This is a documentary of uh, people discussing their theories of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining mm -hmm. and what they read in as being the hidden subtext that Kubrick was really trying to tell you about. Um, Who it, knows what yeah, Kubrick's trying to tell people? Stellar sane people of our society telling stories yes. about what's in the movie. Uh, 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 so some of the theories are further out than others. <laughs> <laughs> but but honestly, all of them seem... Support seems, that the moon landing was faked? There's yeah. a good one. I'm on board with that one. <laughs> actually, actually, the guy is very passionate about... About he he is not saying the moon landing is fake. He is only saying he, he is only saying that the footage of the moon landing <laughs> there was we fake. Go. Oh, we must differentiate. That if you, That's if you, important. If, if you understand front projection techniques as well as he understands the way front front projection works, you would look at that moon landing footage and realize that it has to be a soundstage. Interesting. Yes. But that's only one theory. There's yeah. also talk about how really The Shining is about the Holocaust. Yeah. Or it's really about destruction of Native American cultures. Or uh, a million other theories that they float out there and they're trying to put importance to this film. It's fascinating. Right. It, but Kubrick, it really lo Kubrick anyway. loves to work in obscurity and he doesn't even know what his own theory, his <laughs> ideas are. In, in any case... It is a little interesting reading, like, after hearing all these interpretations people have about Kubrick's The Shining, it's interesting that somebody's making a prequel based on their interpretation of <laughs> Kubrick's The Shining. Well, why not? If it's good for these other people to have, it's good for someone else to create a new one and make a prequel out Absolutely, of it. Absolutely. Why right. not? <laughs> well, post credit scenes are a staple of the Marvel movie universe, giving fans a hint of what's to come in future installments. Of course. The upcoming Iron Man 3 will not be any exception. However, there are reports from screenings of the film that indicate the movie is taking a huge page from the Avengers and will get not one, but two count them, two post-credit scenes. And See, yay. this would be a story if there were three. Exactly. So basically, every, this is every not time, a story, and, in my opinion. And, and pretty much it, it, what it ends up being is a three-and-a-half-hour movie where you have a three-hour movie and then you have a half hour of ending credits. Well, what I, what, what's bugging me here is they're making this big story about what well, we're going to have these two credits, uh, these two post-credit editions. One is going to be uh, something that sets the groundwork for Guardians of the Galaxy, and the mm. other one, the final one, just like they did with Avengers. It's going to be this little lighthearted thing. And all it is is Tony Stark um, looking for some help. And uh, he has a th there's a high profile cameo in there. And it's, it's supposed to be akin to the restaurant scene at the end of Avengers. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, so why is it's this a, a story? It's a little Easter egg. Right. It's a big, you know, they do a lot of these little Easter, Easter eggs. And again, they're setting up for another movie. So that's it's a nice little but it's teaser nothing or new. something else. And it's nothing new. This is this Avengers is, already did it. So why is this now a story? I don't know why this well, is a story because are, this makes. Are you guys mad at us for reporting on this? No, no, no it's not that. It's <laughs> no, just. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind I'm of puzzled just... as to why why uh, the author of this story decided that it was such a huge deal. Well, yeah, I guess my my question is: It sounds pretty similar to Avengers, where you, the credits started rolling, and then you had a sequence, and then more credits started rolling, and then and you then had a very the end. Yeah, and, and then you sequence. had a very final tag. That's what they're doing here. Or you get the you get the uh, the, uh, um, the 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 um, oh, uh, Matthew Broderick. Um, 
uh, oh, like at Ferris Bueller Day Off. Ferris Bueller, where it basically keeps going and going and going and going. And it comes back. Yeah. Get to the end of the movie. It's like the movie's over. Just go. go. <laughs> just just go. It's like we're, it's, no more. We're done. <laughs> Which will be funny because uh, I think they did something with Iron Man three uh, initial trailer that, mm-hmm. that uh, Robert Downey Jr. did for Super Bowl Sunday. Mm-hmm. Something similar to that, so that would actually work quite well. That would actually be fun. I mean, I, I mean, it's been done forever. I mean, I know. we're so used to see these Easter eggs in the in the credits are nothing new. We've seen them forever and ever and ever, and we're going to continue seeing them. It's just, uh, it, it, I love them. I do too. Yeah, it makes I'm, it I'm because really I'm a credit watcher. I, I, I always stick about, around. I talked about I talk about this all the time. I love watching the end credits because the end credits have so much really cool stuff in there, and it, it, it is good to know these people. Now, when the pages and pages and pages of all the people doing the graphic, I kind of zone along, after a while. I zone out on those, but it is nice to get the key players. You know, who is the key grip? You know, basically, who were the electricians? Who these people actually were inter- instrumental in making the movie? It's nice to give them at least a little bit of acknowledgement yeah and, and, and give e- some time for it and that. even though it may be an enormous bit of info dump mm-hmm. as i'm watching it at least by me sitting and uh looking at the credits it's my way of acknowledging everything that they did so yeah right. naturally i always stay and of course marvel is not the first uh first uh franchise of films to actually throw this idea as you pointed out ferris bueller's uh day off they did that Mm -hmm. so we know that they're going to do it with iron man 3 i mean we can't go into any more details about it because to be honest we don't know what they are exactly whatever it is people stick stick around around. it'll be fun it'll be fun you know what on that on that note i think we ought to take a quick break and do something else (sighs) calm down a little bit and get ready for some more news Yes. There we go. And it's all yours. Hey, Slicers, this is George here at Hypno Comics and Games, and I'm I'm sitting here, I'm just sitting here with, like, this epic painter, Dave Dorman. Huh? He's here in California. Yeah, just a guy who draws. Dave Dorman, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in California right now? Well, I was brought out here for um, uh, to be a, a judge at the Writers and Illustrators of the Future uh, contest. And so that happened last night. It was a great, uh, great space, great uh, award ceremony. A lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, then I'm uh, visiting some friends here. Uh, <laughs> you know, enjoying some of the California weather. In yeah. Chicago, it's very cold. So uh, yeah. get a little break on the weather. Nice, beautiful California yeah. day. So he's yeah. going to be spending a little time with us. We're going to be doing a full interview here in a little while. Uh, but we just wanted to like let you know what he's here in California doing and where he's going to be coming up. And he's going to be appearing at C2E2 here. So that's going to be, I think, in the next week or two. C2E2 is uh, next week in, in Chicago. Uh, is April uh, 25th, I believe. It starts on Thursday. And then in May, I'll be at the Spectrum Art Show for those hardcore illustration fans of mine. Uh, it'll be Spectrum in uh, Kansas City. And then, of course, San Diego uh, during the summer in July. Uh, always there in San Diego. Good show. Yes, Comic Con's great. So I'll probably drop by and bug you there. Okay. Um, I won't be at C2E2, but you guys need to drop by and see him at C2E2. He'll post his um, his blo- his table number and stuff up on DaveDorman.wordpress.com. That's right. So you can get his table number there. And these are some of the sketchbooks he's going to have available available at his table. Um, maybe a new one too, just in time for the show. So be sure to drop by and say hi. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Go get him, slicers. Here's what's happening. And, of course, that interview will be available at SliceOfSciFi.tv. You can also follow the links back from SliceOfSciFi.com. But uh, SliceOfSciFi.tv, that's where you find all this fun stuff. Look for that later this week. With the reboot of The Evil Dead scaring up a solid opening weekend, many fans are wondering if there will be a sequel anytime soon. Uh, duh. Of course there will. Ah, but not to the reboot. (laughs) <laughs> now I have to wonder when it says fans, which fans we're we're, we're talking about specifically. Mm, but good point. Um, because honestly, I I would be very interested to see what they could come up with for a sequel to that reboot. Nevertheless, <laughs> instead of a sequel to the reboot, the question is: Could a fourth installment be on the way for the original series? I would love to see that. Mm-hmm. Mm. To find out, Digital Spy went straight to Bruce Campbell and posed the question. Campbell says that right now anything is just speculation and bull 
Yeah, asterisk. that stuff, yeah. <laughs> Bull asterisks. Bull asterisks. <laughs> but that a fourth Evil Dead could be started this summer. Hmm. Now, we're not seriously talking about another army of darkness until about six months ago, Campbell said. Now we're actually talking about it, and Sam is going to have a whack at it with his brother, Ted Raimi. That's what he's threatening to do. But this has been threatened before. Many times yeah. it's been threatened before. And Ted, well, Ted just got done with, with uh, Spartacus, with the, uh, you know, War of the Damned and so forth, and the final, all, all that stuff is all over with. So he's got some time on his hands now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Sam and Ted could get together and actually put something... Yeah, well, it's true. Yeah, you know, the you evil, know. De- evil dead buzz is out there at this point. You it know, could it could raise uh, an interest in the original series again. Mm, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do we want to hear Megan scream? Yes, we do. We do? What? Okay. I, wa- I want to see more. Why would more. you do? What? Well, because it's about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The movie. <laughs> she's walking she's away walking out of the room wow i will speak loudly so that she can still hear <laughs> i hate you and the, the big the news worst. is they have their splinter yes <gasps> he is danny woodburn he now, was he's re- okay but yeah, mm. he was uh recently the dwarf grim mm-hmm. um and will play the half-shelled hero's rat mentor the Hunger Games Catching Fire star Alan Richson, Noel Fisher, Peter Plazek, and Jeremy Howard have all been cast as the eponymous quartet, while Megan Fox will play reporter April O'Neil. Oh, really? <laughs> on a positive note, Arrested Development's Will Arnett is also on board for this film, but we have no idea who he's playing. I, you, I don't even I, understand this movie anymore. It's it, I, I'm, you, I'm. You mean you understood it at one point? <laughs> at one point, it was I understood a Michael that it was Bay being movie. made. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know anymore. You guys, <laughs> humanity, what's up? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm with Megan on this. This is becoming such a convoluted, hot mess. I don't care anymore. I, I just no. really don't care anymore. Yeah. Unless they come in and just totally blow it up and recast well, it with I, a bunch of really epic people. I I'm did done. read an interview with Alan Richson just two days ago who said, all the buzz that's going on about Ninja Turtles, everybody, you guys are wrong. This movie's going to really just knock you dead. Really? Yes. Well, okay. Uh, all well, I, all I know is what I'm seeing and hearing, and it's not great so far. I haven't seen yeah. a single darn thing, and all I'm hearing is news reports. And so far, I'm not impressed. Yeah, the only thing that I think could get me excited is if I knew that they were just going back to the original source material <laughs> and doing mm-hmm. a faithful animated movie. Hmm. That would be that would be good if they went yes. back to the animated source. Animated would always be better. Uh, I don't know about Source because I grew up with the cartoon, so that's not the comic book. So I met. I imagine <laughs> people very who like the comic book are going to be mad at me. But either way, the movie can't be good for people who like the comic book or for people who like the original cartoon. Hey, it's or for Michael people who Bay. Like the he can't do wrong. Now. He can't do what? He can't do wrong. Oh, mm. <laughs> at least I, in I, his I know, mind. I know people who I know people who would agree with that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, the poor poor Megan. She's she's been. And then on to the, you know what? We got two seconds. Since we're talking one. about Michael Bay. Oh boy. Transformers Four. Robot porn. More of it. That's that's, <laughs> that's all, it. You know what? That's all we need. That's all we need right there. I don't even want to cover any more of this story. I want to go on to some other news and then call this a show. The following program is brought to you with limited commercial interruptions by Lannister Insurance. Lannister Insurance always pays their claims to any surviving relatives. If there are any surviving relatives. Covering all the news throughout time and space. This is the Multiverse News. Good evening, I'm Lance Neutron, and let's get right to the news because I have a cosmetology quiz to study for. Lance, it's cosmology. Uh, What's the difference? Well, anyway, 
In entertainment news, Nikolai Kosterwaldo, who plays handsome Jamie Lannister in Game of Thrones, said it was a handy role to pick up. It was hands down the best character he has played. That role wasn't handed to him on a plate, though it has taken a long time since he first tried his hand at acting to grasp such a complex character. Jamie fits me like a glove, he said. He's no one's right-hand man. And I would not be going out on a limb to say I've grabbed this role with both hands. If Game of Thrones were to finish now, it would be like losing a limb. When asked what's coming up for the character Jamie, Nikolai was at first stumped for a reply, but he did say that with these writers, he was in capable hands. If he does eventually get cut from the show, he expects a golden handshake. West Virginia is considering whether to ban Google Glass while driving. For those of you who haven't heard about it, Google Glass is a heads-up display that goes over your eye and can record video and display information. Google Glass is, however, considered much safer than the earlier version of the product called Google Goggles. Users suffered uncontrollable glottal giggles while using Google Goggles, and the glottal giggles caused the Google Goggles to download a picture of a gaggle of geese that obscured vision. So, because of the Google Goggle gaggle of glottal giggle geese glitch, the product was scrapped in favor of Google Glass. Bosco, did you write that story? <laughs> Bad dog. And finally, after serving as evil emperor for only six months, Emperor Palpatine had to step down when Jay Leno wanted his old job back. That's the news, and we take you back to Mike and the Mannix at the Draco Vista Studios. <laughs> Knock it oh, out of the park! Yeah, we that need that a round great. of applause for that one. That, that was absolutely was grand awesome. slam. Yeah. That was awesome. Amazing stuff. And uh, what a great way to go out on the show right there. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we will see you again in a couple days. But, man, I don't think we can top that one. No. That's, yeah. that, was, that was it. That was awesome. Very, very, very good stuff. You know the numbers, 206-339. Track that's 206-339-8735. Send us some interesting comments and stuff like that. Go to the website, slice sci-fi.tv, slice sci-fi.com. Find us on the internets. Find us on the Facebook the Twitters, all that fun stuff. We will see you soon.